The unsurpassed profound and wonderful Dharma is difficult to encounter in billions of aeons. I now see it here to receive and uphold it about to fathom the title that's true meaning to liberate all beings unless generally the Supreme Bodhicitta. Let us begin our class on the Shrangama Sutra. Today we will have the Shrangama Sutra class. Next week we will have the classes on the Karandaviha Sutra, which is the baskets display, and then the later three classes are on the Shrangama Sutra. Today we will continue with the teaching on the six penetrations on the well penetrated roots. In the previous class, we have already talked about that. Uh, Ananda would not be able to understand the teachings if the Buddha were to directly give him the teachings. So um, he would uh, he would rather give the teachings through the strikings of the bell by Rahula. Rahula, under the instruction of the Buddha, stru 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 struck the bell for four times. After such, the Buddha asked Ananda, and the assembly saying that, have you heard the sound? The first two questions were, did you hear? And then the second one, the second or two sets of the questions were whether there were sounds. At the beginning of listening to these questions, it sounds rather quite shallow, very conventional, and too simple as well. It sounds like some teachings, it sounds like such simple conversations, and we can't really think of the profundities of those teachings by ourselves. Today we will delve into the profundity of those teachings. Teachings. The question that's posed by Ananda from yesterday was that Ananda stated the fruition is something that is constant and indestructible. However, such kinds of fruition can only be sought at the causal stage through extinguish. How is that? reasonable. How could you seek for something indestructible through destructing something? How could you uh, seek for something that is constant by seeking, by practicing extinguish first? And then the Buddha said that, well, look at the sound that you hear. Are they a constant or are they extinguished? Ananda thought that, well, it must be extinguished. I heard it and then later it disappeared. So there is this um, extinguishing that cannot be connected to the future liberation. But the Buddha then gave the instruction that the hearing is indeed our uh, mind consciousness, which is uh, luminous, which is our awareness, and is constant. This luminous awareness is constant, is not extinguished. And then there is an example that we will be studying later about if a person were to be in deep sleep, this hearing is of luminous awareness and is constant. Though that you cannot see it, um, it seems that you will hear something at the beginning and then later you don't hear it anymore. It seems to be false, but the true listening, this luminous awareness is constant. Even during the time of uh, uh, at the dormant stage, the sound that is the object, that is the dust, is of extinguished. So at the stage of practicing in the causal stage, you should recognize your own awareness and then continuously to engage in practice so that at the time of fruition ground, the indestructible fruit would naturally be obtained. At the time 
time of practice, at the time of, uh, for example, engaging in meditation, we would abide in the state that is without elaboration. That is the um, realization that we can obtain at the fruition ground. Other than that, there is nothing that is produced by causes and conditions that we can obtain at the fruition ground. So we should understand that. The Buddha then replied Ananda's questions. Ananda asked so many questions. Ananda's questions are our questions. We probably have even more questions than Ananda because Ananda had already obtained the uh, Shodapana fruition, the, the first fruition and he can be considered as a noble one. Compared to us, he is definitely a noble one. And Ananda asked so many questions and cried for so many times. Now we're going to study that he's going to cry for the sixth time. A lot of commentaries counted and calculated how many times he cried so far and what he cried for. It's almost similar to how people would pay lots of attention to so-and-so celebrity cried today and uh, in whatever kinds of situation this celebrity cried. In the commentary, we would be able to see how Ananda cried and why he cried as well. Let's look at today's content. The Buddha then said to Ananda in the Great Assembly, saying that, why are you inconsistent in what you say? Because previously, Ananda and the assembly told the Buddha saying that at the time of striking there is sound, at the time of uh, uh, without striking there is no sound. So at that time Ananda also Ananda told the Buddha saying that at the time of practicing on the causal ground there is extinguish, uh, extinguishment but at the time of creation there is uh, uh, indestructible Constructible quality to it, then how could that be so? Because they are obviously contradictory to each other. Now, how could you call yourself a truth, a one that speaks truth and truth only? This is contradictory. How would we understand it? And then the Buddha told Ananda, as well as the assembly, saying that what you are speaking is also contradicting. Your speech is not consistent. They're inconsistent, what you stated. The Great Assembly and Ananda asked the Buddha, saying that, in what way have we been inconsistent? Simultaneously, the Assembly and Ananda asked the Buddha, saying that, well, how how is it that we asked the inconsistent, uh, replied inconsistently? We only replied truthfully. When we heard, we said that we heard. When we didn't, we said that we didn't. We were very truthful. Unlike you, all of a sudden, uh, all, unlike you, at the beginning stated that it was of uh, extinguished and then later saying that it was uh, constant. The assembly truly don't understand why the Buddha would point out that they were inconsistent. The Buddha said, yes, you do, you don't understand. Let me tell you how you made a mistake. Listen to my analysis, and then you can make the judgment whether you made a mistake or not. In terms of hearing and sound, the Buddha started making analysis to the Great Assembly and, the, and Ananda. The Buddha then said, when I asked you if it was your hearing, then I asked you if it was your, it was if it was sound. You said it was sound. I cannot assert I cannot ascertain from your answer if it is hearing or if it is sound. How can you not say it, this is inconsistent? 
When I asked you whether it was whether you can hear, you said it was your hearing. And then when I asked you whether there is sound, you said it was sound. So sometimes you say it is hearing, sometimes it is sound. Through that, you can see that your answer has had been inconsistent. How can you not say this is inconsistent? At first you said there is hearing, and then later you said there is sound. The Buddha over here did not emphasize on hearing and not hearing, or sound or not sound. Rather, he focused on the hearing and the sound. The difference is that the hearing is related to consciousness, which is consistent, and then the sound, which is a defiling object, is moment by moment. It is that the disciples have given the answers to the Buddha by addressing something that is moment by moment and something that is constant. That is why the answers of the disciples are contradicting to one another. And then the Buddha continued to say that, Ananda, when the sound is gone without an echo, you say there is no hearing. At the time there is no sound, you said there is no sound. So the previous one is to refute the existence, and then the next one is refuting on the non-existence. And then the Buddha continued to say that, that when the sound is gone without the echo, you say there is no hearing. If there were really no hearing, the hearing nature would be extinguished. If you really do not hear, then the hearing nature has extinguished. It would be just like dead wood. Doesn't matter how much the bell would sound again, you would no longer know anymore, just as how a dead wood would no longer re sprout and uh, uh, grow flowers and fruits. What you know to be there or not, there is the defiling object of sound. At that moment, doesn't matter how much of the striking of the sound uh, the bell is, you would not be able to hear it anymore because uh, your hearing is just like a dead wood. That's based on what you've declared. That is contradicting to each other. If the um, hearing nature is truly existent, the, after it has already extinguished, there is no way for it to respout. doesn't matter how much you water it and nurture it, the dead wood would no longer to regrow. Now let us continue with the analysis. The Buddha then said that what you know to be there or not there is the defiling object of sound. But would the hearing nature be there or not be there, depending on your perception of its being there or not? If the hearing could really not be there, what would perceive that it was not? Well, in fact, what you said about the sound being there or not, simply you're pointing out the sound as the defiling object, the defiling object that is the sound out of the six defiling objects, the six dusts, the form, sound, smell, taste, touch, all of those. So you're simply pointing out this defiling object that is the sound is there or not. Because of this condition, would you still say that your hearing nature would be there or not based on the sound? Since your, your hearing nature, if you were to say that your hearing nature would be there and not be there, that is wrong because there is no change that's associated to the nature of hearing. 
We had already studied that previously. The forms or all of the defiling object could have changes of it, uh, is or not. However, the nature of your seeing of the seeing essence would not change. In the previous part, we had already studied it. So, um, the sound object, the defiling object of sound, would have the changes, but the hearing nature. Nature would not change to is and is not based on the changes of the sound uh, object. If the hearing could really not be there, what would perceive that it was not? Over here, the Buddha points out that if you say the hearing nature really can cease to exist in the absence of sound, what would perceive that it was not? What would know of its absence? The Buddha uh, simply points out the luminous nature, the luminous awareness, the true nature is inherent within all sentient beings. If you can see its true nature, then such kinds of brilliant nature is constant. It is different than the um, sound that is the uh, defiling object. If the sound that is defiling object is your subject, then it could be existent and not existent. There could be changes. But when it comes to our subject, that is is the hearing nature, it does not change. According to the mind-only school, it, is, it considers that the external existence is not existent. The external phenomena is not existent. However, the luminous nature that parts from the dichotomy is constantly existent. That's one perspective, which is a bit similar to the teaching over here. So over here, sometimes I would also think that when it comes to the um, teaching of the sound and the nature, we could very much mix it up. Yesterday, when we studied the question part um, that's posed by the Buddha, I also got a little confused because at first I thought that the sound and hearing would be the same, but they're definitely not the same. Without hearing, in fact, hearing or not, that hearing aspect is the manifested aspect of the luminous nature um, that is the wondrous manifest of the Buddha nature, for such kinds of luminous aspect would not cease since it does not have production or cessation. It is simply at the causal ground, it is something that we can practice with. At the fruition ground, such luminous aspect would unfold its natural and inherent merit. I think the Sutrayana analysis is very similar to that of the Mahaati pointing out as well. For those of you who had already attained a certain kinds of insights through the practice of Ati, the teachings of Shurangama would definitely be able to answer lots of your questions as well. In our previous class, I think we also talked something that's a little bit similar to this teaching that's given here, but this part is quite clear and very essential too. The Buddha then continued to say that, and so, Ananda, the sounds that you hear are what are subject to production and extinction. The sound that is the object, the defiling object, are subject to production and extinction. It could appear and disappear. However, it does not not ap apply to your hearing, not your hearing. The arising and the cessation of sounds cause your hearing nature to be as if they're or not there. This part is very clear. The hearing nature is different than the um, defining object that is the sound. Your hearing nature is not moving, just like the space is not moving, but those, the clouds in the space would move. It comes to existence and then uh, ceases to exist. Similarly, the sound that is the defiling object do have production and the cessation. 
cessation. However, your hearing nature does not have such production and cessation along with the existence and non-existence of the sound. Your sound nature does not come to be uh, come to being and cease to being. That is not possible, though it appears to such a way. According to some commentaries, it says that the Hearing nature is just like the mirror. However, the sound that is defiling object is just like the reflections reflected within the mirror. So it is says that the hearing nature does not move, just like the mirror, and then the sound that comes to per, uh, existence and cessation, just like the reflections within the mirror. But of course, the mirror is not necessarily constant in comparison of that. However, just to compare the mirror itself and then the reflections within the mirror, there is a difference between the two. One is solid and one is uh, quite ephemeral. For the same reason, the sound has the production and cessation, but the nature of hearing does not have production nor cessation. This is one example that applies to the hearing nature, but it applies to all the other roots as well. Um, I think everyone should know that by now. Previously, we probably think that, well, if I were to recognize it, is it going to cease even at the time of death? Or does the nature uh, uh, come from certain place or being produced from certain place and cease at certain place? We sometimes would have all kinds of doubts like that. At times like such, we should know that the external sound defiling object it could cease with causes and conditions. However, the hearing, the hearing nature, the, the hearing itself, though sometimes we could hear and sometimes we don't, but the hearing nature, which is the brilliant awareness, the luminosity, uh, sometimes, though it could hear or not, but the nature of it is um, the nature of is the manifestation of a Buddha nature, and it is without produ production and without cessation. I noticed lots of young people over here, and I feel that at my age, I would be more forget forgetful, and uh, I really wish that I listened to this sutra around 20 years of age. That would be very helpful. <coughs> some people used some people have really good memories recently uh, toku toku bail from both the sakya school and nima school uh, recently passed away he is also a guru to Tsongsa Rinpoche. I think he recently passed away at the age of uh, over 90. He had given some Vajrayana teachings at the time of bestowing empowerments. The particular teaching had 18 volumes. Usually it would take 45 days to bestow that teaching. And at the time of giving that empowerment, he said he received this particular teaching at the age of 15 from Tsongsa Gyamyang Choki Lojo, but he remembered each of the teachings very clearly. Within the teaching that he gave, the treasury of the teachings included the Vajrayana teachings of eight schools. There are different places where he would wear different hats, literally put on the hats of Kagyupa, of Galupa. There are a few different empowerments within that particular teaching, so he would wear different hats to, uh, to signify the different schools. And then he received the teachings at, eight, at 15 years old, and he remembers all of those details at the age of 80 and 90. If we can receive the teachings at, of uh, Shurangama Sutra at 15 years of age or 20, I think lots of the teachings would be very clear. 
But when we get older, those teachings would be a little bit easier for us to forget. Maybe we would forget about the teachings after a week. But I think if you are still a bit younger and you still can memorize those teachings, it would be the best for you to memorize it because it would be extremely helpful for your practice of the Vajrayana as well. And then the Buddha continued to say that you are so upside down that you mistake sound for hearing. Uh, no wonder you are so confused that, that you take what is everlasting for what is annihilated. Ultimately, you cannot say that there is no hearing nature apart from movement and stillness and from obstruction and penetration. While the Buddha says that, as you see, you're so upside, you're so upside down, so confused that you mistake sound for hearing. No wonder you're so confused that you take what is everlasting for what is annihilated, for something that is um, rather quite uh, uh, ephemeral. The Buddha over here says that well, you can't even differentiate sound and hearing. No wonder you couldn't differentiate what is everlasting and what is annihilated. Ultimately, you cannot say that there is no hearing nature apart from movement and stillness and from obstruction and penetration. So there, if you were to say that there is um, no hearing, that is not reasonable. If you were to say uh, so over here, the movement and stillness refers to the sound that is the, the object, the object, the uh, defiling object, and then the penetration and obstruction refers to the roots. At the time of perceiving the object, there is the penetration of the root, and at the time of obstruction, there at the time of obstruction, then and there is no uh, perception of the object. So over here it refers to the root and object. But parting from the root and object, if you were to say that there is no nature to hearing, that is completely wrong. After parted from the root, after parted from all the root and all the objects, the hearing nature is still there. As we stated yesterday, there were the six examples that the Buddha had given, for example, the spirit of Ganji uh, and uh, Aniruddha, Kashyapa, all of them, they did not necessarily have the six roots. However, the nature to their six roots are still existent. The nature of hearing and the nature of seeing, nature of smelling, nature of consciousness, and all of those are still existent. In fact, over here, we're talking about this luminous awareness that is not relying on, to, on roots, that is not reliant on objects. It is uh, constantly abiding. It is everlasting. By now, Ananda still doesn't understand, so the Buddha then give him another example. Consider a person who falls into a deep sleep while napping on his bed while he is asleep. Someone in his household starts beating clothes or pounding rice. In his dream, the person hears the sound of beating and pounding and takes it for something else, perhaps for the striking of a drum or ringing of a bell. In the dream, he wonders why the bell sounds like stone or wood. This example refers to a person who fell asleep and he's taking this deep nap on his, on his bed. While asleep, his family member started to started to wash the clothing by beating the clothing. It is to, to use this um, this stick to beat the clothing. As you know, in ancient times, that's what people used to do, use a large stick and uh, beat the clothing in the water to give the clothes a lesson. And then also to 
pound rice. To pound rice, to pound rice inside a little bucket. In the past, we used to also pound the um, barley or uh, even those peppers. Sometimes, when we talk about pounding, we talk about there's this particular pun punishment in hell realm. There's pounding as well. So. In his dream, in this person's dream, he hears the sound. While asleep, this person hears the sound. But in his dream, he perceives it as the sound of other things, either the striking of a drum or the ringing of a bell. However, in the dream, he wonders why the bell sounds like stone or wood. Since this person's family member were using the wood and uh, stone-made material to make those sounds, then this person that is asleep thought that it was the sound of striking of a bell or the ringing of uh, uh, the ring of the bell or striking of the drum. However, the sound sounds rather quite strange. It sounds more like the sounds from wood and stone. So what it points out is that while at the time that the person is sleeping, initially the ear and eyes as the roots, there is no function to them. However, because of this luminous mind, then one would be able to rely on the uh, object one would still be able to hear the sound. I had a nap this at noon today. I usually would take a nap around nine minutes, especially when I get quite tired of reading. Around the six minutes time, I started snoring, and then I thought, it started raining heavily, and then I woke up because of that. After waking up because of my own snoring, I look at the clock, it's six minutes, but I couldn't take another uh, nap to reach the nine minutes anymore. Anyhow, I mistakenly took that snoring sound as a heavily raining sound and uh, uh, wind, the sound of ghastly wind. Now, back to this person, suddenly he awakens and immediately recognizes the sound of pounding. At the time of waking up, he realized it was the sound of pounding the rice. He tells the members of his household, I was just having a dream in which I mistook the sound of pounding for the sound of a drum. So this person woke up and started complaining, saying that, well, I thought it was the sound of a drum uh, when I heard the sound of pounding rice. It seems to be a very simple example where this person who fell asleep misheard or mistook the rather mistook the sound of pounding the rice as the strike of a drum. But the meaning that is expounded through this particular example points to that at the time of listening uh, during sleep, it is also the manifestation or the working of our luminous awareness. The Buddha then said that, Ananda, how can this person in the dream state remember stillness and movement, opening and closing, and penetrability and obstruction? Yet, although he is physically asleep, his hearing nature is not drowsy. The time, at the time this person is still asleep, there is no remembering of the movement of, and the stillness and uh, opening and a closing and a penetration and uh, obstru obstruction. In fact, at that time in the dream, there is no root that is working. The nose, ear, and the objects do not have true functions. However, 
闭着眼睛的时候呢，哦，刚才那个看到的话，那就是啊，一个人。Well, I think it's better for us to use the root of the eye as an example. It's probably easier to understand. In the dream, you will keep your eyes closed, but then you saw someone earlier before your dreams. Someone was singing and dancing and then wearing this color of red and yellow clothing. And then your mind at the time of dream. Me, you would also reflect the same way. Similarly, at the time of raining outside, you can probably hear the rain, and then in your dream, though your eyes are closed, in your dreams you would also have the similar um, environment as the raining to the outside, though there is no direct function of the rain. As the defining object, so the nature to the hearing is everlasting. This is quite important. And then the Buddha continued to say that even when your body is gone and your light and life move on, how could this nature leave you? Over here, your light, light, and life refers to the root of life or life altogether, according to some common. So it says that you, after your body is gone, after your life has already reached to an end, how could this luminous nature disappear at the at the time that、uh, your body is gone? It is not a possible. Even at the time that your body and your lifespan has come to an end because of causes and conditions, but if you were to recognize the nature of awareness, the nature of luminosity, then this luminous nature would not depart from you. That is why the great masters, at the very young age, they would be able to abide in such a kind of insight and realization. There was a story. I'm sure that you're familiar with this. A Chinese master during the Song Dynasty. Actually, two monks were practicing in Zhongnan、uh, Mountain for twenty years and mainly practiced on the Shuangama Sutra, especially the study. On the luminous nature, the the teachings on the luminous nature. After practicing for twenty years, one、uh, out of the two lost interest in practice and felt that he had already spent so much time in、uh, the studies, but had not come to realization. So he left. And then he went to the city of Chang'an. He stayed in a hotel for a night. Habitually, he started to meditate, and it lasted for a long period of time, for two or three days, without any movements. The hotel manager at the time thought that this old monk must had already died, because there is no breathing and there is no sign of life. It seems. So the manager of the hotel thought that this old monk must had already died, and uh, uh, he found some wood and、uh, started to cremate the body. This old monk indeed did not die. He, in fact, entered into、uh, a deep samadhi. The Jona Mountain is quite famous. I went there before as well. I think once I had given a lecture at the Shanxi University of Science and Technology, which was not too far from the Mount Jona. Mount Jona is famous for being a place for practitioners. There are lots of practitioners from Taoism and from Buddhism. Anyhow. 
Many people would stay in Mount Jonan and engage in, the in their own practice, and the people practiced over there would meditate for days, and there is no problem. But after stayed in this hotel, he habitually entered into a samadhi for three days and three nights. But after he returned back to his body after this deep samadhi, he couldn't find the body anymore because his body was criminated by the manager of the hotel. And he started getting quite scared. At night, he arrived to the hotel and started yelling, where's my body, where's my body? Even the manager heard that sound and uh, nobody, however, nobody could find his body. I think we should have this particular regulation. One should not touch the uh, deceased one's corpse for three days and three nights, and maybe seven days. Otherwise, if the, um, if the person were to return from Samadhi and couldn't find the body, it would be quite troublesome. Anyhow, this particular hotel lost many of the guests because there's the rumor going that there's a ghost in the hotel. After hearing this rumor, his old companion came to this particular hotel. And he went directly to the manager of the hotel and told him that, oh, I can take care of your ghost problem. The manager, also, of course, was really happy. He said, he told the manager that, uh, well, I do have one prerequisite, I do have one requirement is that I need um, some water and uh, some uh, burning wood. In such a way, I would be able to get rid of your ghost problem. And then the, the host said, that's easy and I can do that. So he prepared all of those materials, a bucket of water as well as lots of wood. In the evening, the friend of that practitioner heard the sound of his uh, uh, moaning and uh, crying. So he simply asked the ghost to say that, well, can you get into the water? Um, so the ghost did. And then he said that, where are you? Um, and uh, he said that I'm in the water, but I'm now drowned. And then uh, he pointed the ghost to get into the, uh, the fire that he lit from the pile of wood, saying that, why don't you jump into the fire? And then, so the ghost did also jump into the fire and said that, well, where are you? And the ghost said, I'm in the fire, but I'm not, that, I'm not burned to death either. So this practitioner then asked the ghost, saying that, don't you see the point? Where are you? Where are you? Uh, and then he attained realization and uh, uh, parted ways. The manager got really happy, saying that this is really wonderful. So this is how you can earn money with the ultimate truth. I am simply joking about that. Anyhow, um, this story pointed out that though that our uh, body and uh, the lifespan are connected, but not necessarily connected to the nature of our hearing, not necessarily connected connected to the nature of awareness. It doesn't, our awareness does not die with the cessation of our body and lifespan. And then the Buddha said that, but because living beings from time without beginning have pursued forms and sounds and have followed their thoughts as they turn and flow, they still have not enlightened to the purity, wonder, and permanence of their nature. Because since beginning this time, we had pursued the six defiling objects, the form, sound, smell, touch, and so on. And our dualistic thoughts continuously to pursue after all of those six defiling objects. For such reason, we are still dwelling in samsara, and for such reason, we cannot attain the realization of our pure one wonderful and permanent nature. Not only that, the sentient beings do not accord with what is eternal, but chase after things which are subject to production and extinction. Uh, for such reason, we take 
such uh, a rebirth in samsara. And because of this, they are born again and again because uh, and become mixed with defilements as they flow and turn. So we sometimes would take birth as cows and sometimes as horses, sometimes as human beings, and sometimes as rich, sometimes as poor, sometimes as the one with the merit and sometimes the one with the authority. We would continuously to take rebirth again and again um, without an end. But if they reject production and extinction and uphold true permanence, if we were to reject all of those kinds of conditioned dharma that is subject to production and extinction and uphold the true permanence, then everlasting light will appear. And with that, the sense organs, defiling objects, and consciousness will disappear. It is similar to say that at the time of practicing, uh, for example, in samadhi, when we practice uh, guru yoga, after practicing such, our mind is no other than the mind of the, the guru. If we can abide in such realization, in such insight, then our body abiding as an unconditioned dharma, but our mind is abiding in the unconditioned uh, dharma datu, in this uh, insight in this realization that is without birth and without death, without production, without extinction. If we can habituate ourselves in such state for a long period of time, if we can um, attain such realization, then the permanent nature would naturally appear. And then the appearance of thoughts becomes defilement, so the emotions of consciousness become filth. If you stay far away from these two, then your dharma eye will accordingly become pure and bright. How could you fail to accomplish unsurpassed knowledge and enlightenment? Now, all the six roots, six defiling objects, and the six consciousness would come to extinction. Then the uh, thoughts, the appearance of thoughts, the appearance of thoughts refers to defiling objects, the uh, object, the phenomena that we perceive. So the appearance of thoughts become defilement. If you can part ways from emotions and consciousness, which are the uh, defiled ones, then in the very quick period of time, your dharma eye uh, will accordingly become pure and bright. Currently, we have already finished fourth, the fourth volume, and uh, um, I have the oral transmission of the ninth and the tenth. I will not be able to give you teachings till the ninth or the tenth chapter this year, but we are approaching half of this sutra. According to the Tibetans, we would say that if we can finish half of what we want to achieve, then we can definitely be able to achieve it. Let's try our best to finish a little bit over the half of the volumes. If we can accomplish one word extra, one page extra than half this year. Uh, now let's look at Ananda. Ananda is going to cry again now. Ananda said to the Buddha, world honored one, the thus come one has explained the two meanings. In fact, in the Chinese, this says the, the, the meaning of the second door, uh, which refers to the ultimate. Yet, as I now contemplate people in the world, I believe that if they try to untie a knot and cannot find its center, they will never get the knot undone. So this is the example that Ananda gave. And then he said that a world-honored one, I and all the other sound hearers in the Great Assembly who are not beyond study are the same way. He said that, world honored one, uh, we have already understood that the root of affliction is not existent, but they have not found the source of the six roots, and that is the center of the knot. Previously, the world honored one had already expounded on the nature of hearing is not extinguished, but where is the nature of hearing? It, that is the center of the knot. How can I find the center of it? And then 
the Buddha is quite patient with Ananda. He didn't brush it off by saying that I'll read my books. Uh, in the past, whenever people ask me questions that I get tired of answering, I would say that, well, I translate so-and-so book. Why don't you read it? And then Ananda continued to say that from time without beginning, we have been accompanied in birth and death by ignorance. We have obtained these good roots of erudition and are said to have left the home of uh, left the home life. Yet, in fact, we act as someone with a recurrent fever from beginningless time. We accompanied by ignorance and continuously to take birth and have death in samsara. Now we are so fortunate to have obtained these good roots of erudition. We have listened to so many teachings given by the Buddha and are said to have left the home life. We have already taken renunciation, that means. Yet, in fact, we act like someone with a recurrent fever. This recurrent fever here refers to um, the kind of fever that one day we feel better from the illness and then the other day the fever would uh, occur again. So that is what it means by recurrent fever. That's similar to say that one day we don't have as much afflictions and then the other day we have more afflictions. So Ananda pointed out that though I am renowned as the most erudite out of the assembly, also I am a renounced monastic, but the afflictions and ignorance of mine is just like the recurrent fever that it appears um, either once a day or appears to, uh, once for two days or sometimes would appear and sometimes disappear. Just like some of us, sometimes we get happy and sometimes we have temper, sometimes we have sufferings because of a different condition. Just like the weather in the spring. If Ananda has this recurrent fever of afflictions, then we as Madimbis have far worse illness than his recurrent fever. And then Ananda says that I only hope that you, the great compassionate one, will take pity on us. We are sinking and drowning so that to this this very day we do not know how our bodies and minds are in knots or how to get out untying them. Your explanation will also enable fu uh, future living beings who are in the suffering and the difficulty to avoid the turning wheel and not fall into the three realms of existence. The most essential part of the knot that that fetters us in samsara. Could you, world honored one, give us the method and the teachings for us to untie it so that the suffering beings would be able to be cured from this recurrent fever, as well as not just us, the sentient beings now, but the future sentient beings as well. This is probably a prediction that's made by Ananda to the future sentient beings like us, the sentient beings that sometimes it would feel a little better today and then not so well tomorrow, so that the sentient beings would no longer fall into the three realms of existence. After saying that, he and the entire Great Assembly made full prostrations. He wept profusely, he wept profusely over here uh, and uh, prostrated with the Great Assembly. I think Ananda is quite a sensible person. He is sometimes it would cry and sometimes it would feel quite emotional. Unlike some of us, at the time of listening to class, people would snack and would talk to the others, would chat with the others. Look 
Pat Ananda, sometimes he would cry and he would feel so uh, saddened and uh, so heartbroken and then prostrate and would prostrate to the Buddha. He's very much touched by the Dharma, unlike some of you are considered as jaded practitioners. Ananda, after speaking such, he cried profusely. Tears dropping down from his face as if there is a heavy rain, as we would say in Chinese. At that time, after he wept profusely, he sincerely anticipated, awaited the unsurpassed instruction of the Buddha. So he was crying and then supplicated to the Buddha, also waited sincerely for the answer from the Buddha. He waited for the unsurpassed instruction of the Buddha. Some of the commentaries stated that this is the sixth time the Buddha cried. Uh, the, this is the sixth time Ananda cried, uh, waiting for the Buddha's teaching. There are lots of commentaries that paid lots of attention to Ananda's crying. I'm sure Ananda will cry for a few more times. Now, how would the thus come one answer the question posed by Ananda? We will cover that next class. Chubum Solim Drova Drova Zion.